debate. I see it's standing room only, even though we haven't even put a question mark at the end of the title. Uh, I hope we're going to have a really interesting session. I think we will. We've got great people here up on the panel. So what are we talking about? Well, since the French Revolution, really, we've divided politics into left and right and our political parties with it. But these categories are increasingly being challenged, aren't they? And as Brexit has made clear, the divide between left and right is not always apparent, or indeed even helpful. So is it time to move on to something else? Are left and right the antiquated legacy of an era that is no longer relevant? Or are there perhaps alternatives that would be better descriptions of our current politics, which might help us improve and transform political debate? And goodness knows that needs doing, doesn't it? Does the distinction between the progressive left and the conservative right remain the central issue of our time? Or perhaps there's something more interesting and more original that we can find to replace it. That's what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, as with all of these sessions, I'm going to ask each of our guests here on the panel to talk for just two or three minutes about their views on the subject, and then we're going to debate it. And we have a fantastic panel for you. On my right here is Chantal Mouffe, who is a world-renowned political theorist and a professor at the University of Westminster. On my near left, David Goodhart, who was the founder and editor of Prospect and the author of The Road to Somewhere. And on my far left, <coughs> not politically necessary, Rory Stewart, uh, who I suppose is reluctantly an ex-conservative MP. Uh, you will have all seen his um, amazing pitch to become leader of that party. So I'm going to start with Chantal. Oh, I suppose it's in the well, okay, all right. Well, um, I, I, it's quite interesting that uh, we are, the first question is, do we need a new divide? In fact, I would have expected uh, more, do we, do we still need a divide? Because divide, this, this, this is a question that very often is, uh, is, is posed, you know, I don't know. In fact, if you think of Tony Blair, Macron today, uh, no, en même temps, we don't need any more of a divide. Uh, so I, I find it interesting that the, the question is that we need a new divide. Well, I mean, we are well, going to address that, but first I want to say, I want to indicate I'm going to speak here from the point of view of the political theorists. Because this question that we are asked can be approached from a sociological perspective, from the perspective of political science, and the question is going to be posed in very different ways. So I want to tell you from where I'm speaking. And as a political theorist, I think we need to understand that uh, when we speak of what is the political, and I think this is really at the center of the question, there are basically two understandings. There is the associative conception of the political, political is, you know, the uh, acting in common, the feeling of liberty, in which we should uh, all try to agree, to establish a, a consensus that includes everybody, and then a dissociative Say, no, no, no. Politics has got confront conflict with antagonism. Uh, it has got to do with the fact that the people is divided, uh, the fact that we are always dealing in political collective identities, and that this always uh, uh, requires the determination of uh, us there. Because one of the big questions today I feel is that people say, ah, a step, no, 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 we should, why do we need a step? Why can't we all agree? You know, and of course, this is what the associative say, that is, for instance, the view that we found uh, in the third way of Tony Blair and, and uh, uh, Anthony Giddens, today with uh, Emmanuel Macron in France, en même temps. Well, I think that this is definitely a very dangerous uh, conception, because it's eliminating the conception of the political, the both conflict antagonism, so when they arise, you don't know to deal with them. <coughs> so according to the, the view which uh, I believe, which of course is a dissociative view, the question for a democratic politics is not to try to arrive to a consensus without exclusion, but uh, because that would mean uh, us, who does not uh, have a demos, uh, a correspondent, and I think that's possible. Uh, what we need, and for me this is the central question, and this is where I want to pose the question of, of the uh, divide, uh, how are we going to create the institution which allow, when this conflict arises, that it does not take the form of uh, antagonistic conflict with 
friend and enemy, because this, of course, is very dangerous for democracy, but what I have called in my world agonistic struggle among adversaries. That is, uh, adversaries, their opponents, who know that they are never going to be able to uh, uh, agree, but who respect the point of view of their opponent and accept, you know, to uh, fight a, a, a good democratic procedure. Uh, so I think that what this means is that instead of divide, I don't like the term divide, because I prefer the term frontier. But I, according to this associative view, politics is always creation of us, them, uh, and so there is always a frontier. So divide is something which really does not, for me, is not political. And I think the question fundamentally is that uh, what kind of frontier is the one which is more conducive to a uh, uh, vibrant democracy? Because, and I think we are going to discuss that in detail. Some frontier, uh, or in fact, I'm not saying frontier because for me, a frontier is a divide which is political, and we really have conflicting view of the common good. And um, it's very important to see that some construction of the divide, uh, if you construct them in religious terms, in ethnic terms, that is not conducive to democracy. And this is why, personally, I'm going to defend the, 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 the view here that uh, we need to keep the left-right divide, uh, because this is the divide of the frontier, which is the most conducive to a vibrant democracy. But of course, the whole question is all oh, this left-right frontier is imagined and constructed, you know, and because there are some ways in which uh, um, it's, it's, it's really not something which is uh, uh, useful. For instance, if we think of left-right in terms of social and political categories, uh, and then of course, you know, this is what political theory do normally. Also, they have this group, you know, that's what that, so of course, that's not useful. But I want to propose a, a, a frontier between left and right, frontier in axiological principle. There is a question of values. They are always in a pluralist uh, uh, society, which is uh, accept the pluralism of values, they will always be completing values, but values that it's important to, to, to respect. You know? And this is, in fact, the difference between left and right. For instance, Norberto Bobbio, in a nice little book, he said, finally, the basic difference is that the left is always defending equality, why the, 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 the right is less interested in equality and they tend to uh, different liberty. So I think that this is why it's important to accept that there are always, and I speak of an agonistic debate between people who want a society in which you know, equality and social justice are going to be the main uh, driving force, and I think this is for me what the left is, and another one, which is the right, in which you know, basically they accept uh, a lot of inequality. So this is I'll tell you in advance the position that is going to be the one of the Thank you. Cool. So I think there are, uh, we can begin with the fact that many of us intuitively, implicitly feel that there is a lacking center in politics and that there is an increasing divisive and polarized society. So, uh, John Curtis, for example, the polar, polling guru from Sterling, argues that British opinion used to be a bell curve with the votes in the centre, and it's now a U-shape with the votes on either side and nothing left in the centre. There are two responses to this. Um, one of them is that this is almost an inevitable feature of the nature of modern discourse, partly fueled by social media. In other words, Really, uh, this phone in my pocket and the things that it enables encourages the creation of a public that comes together very quickly against something, that a line runs from the Arab Spring through to Brexit. And part of that line is the general story that there is, to quote my friend David, who's just accused me of living in a bubble, that there is these people living in a bubble. People living in a bubble. Okay, and it's the classic language from that thing, right? You guys live in a bubble. The story is that there are a bunch of people who are out of touch, living up on the top of a little pyramid, who don't really understand what's going on around them. And this becomes a very powerful weapon, doesn't matter whether you're in Egypt, at those people, 
it tends to be uh, a negative pronoun. It's very difficult to translate this movement, whether you're talking about the Arab Spring or Brexit, <coughs> into a positive program of government, because it tends to be an objection towards a particular group. Now, the question then is, how inevitable is this? Is there something about the modern world, something about this machine, which means that any attempt to create a centre ground is doomed? And in fact, actually, the professor suggested that it is in the very nature of democratic politics that an attempt to define a centre ground of consensus is anti-democratic. Her, her implication and her agonistic vision is that actually a truly liberal democracy involves different positions, people dividing lines between them. She likes the divide between left and right, she doesn't like any other divides, but she basically believes democracy involves standoffs between one group and another. I think it is possible, though, to conceive of something more than simply what she was suggesting. So she was suggesting that the resolution to this is to think of a more dignified, courteous way of imagining that disagreement between the two sides. The two sides continue, uh, but that there are rules by which they play and they give respect to each other's positions. I would argue that there is a way of being a Trumpian anti-Trump, that there is a way of using this machine to advocate not for the positions of the right or the left, not for the positions of no deal Brexit or Remain, not for the positions of equality against liberty, that there is a way of using this to connect to the local. And the more things are embedded in the local, the more plausible it is that through practical work, through action, you can discover the virtue of moderation, right? the virtue of avoiding the extreme, the energy that comes from the intermediate states. And I, I want to conclude on this. Heraclitus, since we're talking about philosophy, uh, is very interested in the idea of harmony. And what Heraclitus points out is that harmony comes not by losing the opposites, but by suspending the power of the opposites. He talks about harmony in relation to a musical instrument, and the sound of the string comes from the string being suspended through the tension of the bow. Uh, I'm even more interested in harmony through the bow itself. The center, so the center ground, in fact, is pulling off those two ends, drawing the patriotism from one, the sense of liberty of the other, and then the sense of compassion or social justice of the other, in order to create that form. And what gives it its force is that it operates in the realm of reality. Thank you.
investigate a little bit more in, uh, in ethical issues rather than, you, rather than sending everybody to university. Um, but if that does happen, that will be partly because of a response of the political class to the Brexit vote and a feeling that the socio-cultural issues, um, you know, the so-called left behind people, have not been included sufficiently in the conversation. So we've got convergence on left and right, but divergence on the social and cultural issues. And we don't yet have a kind of fully worked out language or set of concepts to, to articulate these new cultural divisions. I don't think, when I wrote a book a couple of years ago, Marianne mentioned in which I talked about people who see the world from anywhere and people who see the world from somewhere, the kind of mobile, um, educated people who value openness and autonomy and rooted, uh, less well educated people who tend to value security. It's the achieved identity of the enemy. Sorry, can you speak up a little bit, please? Okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, we don't have a fully worked out concept for describing the new cultural divides, and our parties are sort of reforming themselves around these new cultural divides. I think, um, but I think one of the things that almost all of the opinion and value surveys will tell you is that our politics has actually had a kind of hidden majority for much of the last few decades, um, and it is the, it's the hidden majority described by the American political scientist Daniel Bell. He was asked sometime in the 1980s or 90s, he's dead now, but he was asked by a journalist, what is your political credo? And that's, uh, I, mean, I mean, translating slightly, he basically said, I'm a market-friendly social democrat in economics, I'm a liberal in politics, and I'm somewhat conservative in social and cultural matters. Now, you know, the left went off in a, in, a, in a culturally liberal direction in the 1960s and never really came back. The right went off in an economically liberal direction in the 1980s and has partially come back. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at actually the Tory manifesto in 2017, it's probably closer to that hidden majority than, than any party manifesto we've had. It was full of social democratic rhetoric. Um, and I do think this is, um, um, I mean, uh, my, my, my final point, I do think... Um, I think in the longer run, um, our politics will become much more determined by sort of temperament in a way. I mean, you might say anyways versus somewheres is essentially kind of liberals versus small c conservatives. And we're always going to have that divide. There are always going to be, you know, if you have children, you know, some of your children tend to be quite open and uh, welcome novelty, and, and others are more sort of conservative and, and worry about change. We're always going to have, have those divisions. And I think politics will become increasingly determined by those things. But I think in the, sh in the short and medium term, what this means for our politics is that we will, um, ructions in the Conservative Party aside, it will be easier for the central right to dominate politics than for the centre left for this reason. That it's easier, as we have just seen, as we saw in the 2017 election, as I think we will see after Brexit if it happens, it is easier for the right to move left on economics than it is for the left to move right on politics. And that gives the centre right a really big inbuilt advantage, I think. Um, and I hope that Rory will be part of the Conservative team that takes advantage. No, I do remember. So. I do remember David Blunkett when he first became Home Secretary saying to me, Mary Ann, you won't believe how right wing I am. <laughs> <laughs> so there has there is a bit of a tradition on the left actually of being quite socially conservative. So, so let's, let's now talk about whether this distinction between left and right is of the past and, uh, and whether it's no longer relevant to contemporary politics. So Rory, David has pretty much said that, that the old-fashioned left and right divide um, has least partly dissipated and has been replaced by what you might call either anywhere and somewhere, but a lot of people talk about the open-closed divide, people who are open on social issues, immigration, gay marriage, that sort of thing, and people who are socially conservative. Do you think post-Brexit, assuming there ever is a post-Brexit, and we've stopped labelling ourselves need and remain, do you think that might replace it? Well, th there's certainly a lot of um, evidence for David's view. <coughs> I actually, my, my political bet is against him. But to, to give it credit, this, you can certainly do an analysis of the British voting public and their views on Brexit, where you can divide people between open and closed. Um, I don't recognise it in myself, and I don't recognise it in my own voters of country. You know, I am somebody who is romantic and traditional about 
about the Queen, about the British Army, about our history, about our tradition. I love small sheep farmers. I'm a conservative, right? I mean, I, that, that's where I come from. Uh, I'm obsessed with history. Uh, but at the same time, I am absolutely appalled by the push for a no deal Brexit. I'm very relaxed uh, in, about issues which really rile up many people in the Brexit party. And I believe that my tradition, which is, broadly speaking, a tradition of one nation conservatism, or on the Labour side, I suppose, is roughly associated with New Labour, is a perfectly viable way of articulating a way of being British. And it has a certain genius in it. And I think the genius is that actually we tend as a nation historically to resolve our conflicts through compromise, that the the religious wars of the 16th century, the fight between Puritans and Catholics, were resolved through a fudge called the Church of England. But the civil war between Parliament and Crown was resolved by a fudge called constitutional monarchy. And that the theorists of open and closed would have tried to suggest that that was impossible. They would have tried to suggest that constitutional monarchy was the worst of all worlds. You know, why on earth would you want this? As a Republican, this is offensive, there's a hereditary principle. As a monarchist, this, this monarchy has no power, there's no point having it anyway. So I think, for me, the, I, I'm betting hard that there is um, a different way of being British, that you can feel a lot of the romantic attachments to many of the things that made myself and my family conservatives, while still feeling a deep sense of shame about poverty, while still feeling very, very relaxed about things that really anger the Brexit party. That's my view. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Open v. Close was actually a, a division um, um, articulated by Tony Blair um, in a speech, of, I think, after he stopped being Prime Minister. And, and I, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's a very, I think it's a, it's a pretty useless division. <laughs> or it's a very self-regarding division. Because it's basically saying, look, you know, we are the kind of modern, open, cool people. And there are those horrible people who want to live in a closed society. Have you ever met anyone who wants to live in a closed society? No, I haven't. But a lot of people do feel forms of openness that we've had have not been in their interest. And this is, this is, I think, Rory's slight fallacy of the centre ground. I mean, he sort of, he wants to recreate Blairism or some Tory version of Blairism. And it is precisely that that has created the political alienation that led to Brexit, Trump and European populism. We have got to adjust our politics to take account of these neglected feelings. You know, essentially, in my language, the anywheres have been running the show, and they have run the show for the last 25 years in their own interests. Our societies have changed enormously in that time. Since the end of the Cold War, we've become so much more open, economically, socially, and culturally, and much of that has been wonderful, but there are lots of people who feel that it hasn't worked in their interest. You know, the, 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 the supply chain really did move to China. Factories were closed down. And then a whole lot of people were, were brought into the country to compete against them in the service jobs they were doing. And they felt that the, the national social contracts were being neglected. All of these things, I think, are perfectly legitimate feelings that were not recognised by the people in London. And so we've had some pushback against that. And a new centre is emerging that needs to take account more of those, sort of, of those somewhere priorities and intuitions. And I think it is. Because I think, you know, when, when people talk about progressive politics, they're talking about doing adult social care, building more housing, you know, investing in FE colleges that have been... They're talking about immigration, right? Uh, uh, well, yes. I, I just uh, want to speak Charles yeah. So, you know, the political system has to adjust to yeah. take Well, no, but first I would like to say, I do agree with David. <laughs> for, uh, for instance, I do believe also that uh, um, the... the I, I think, by the way, the, the Brexit is a sign of a democratic crisis here, but, but, uh, and it's the consequence of the, the, the third way. I mean, this is why I'm really amazed when people say, no, the solution no, is to come back to centrist politics. No, we must be aware of the fact that all the, 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 the opposition to, to you know, the, the situation, which is directed by, by Brexit, is a consequence of t t 30 years of neoliberal hegemony, and particularly of the fact that, you know, uh, the, the Labour Party, which in fact normally should have been the one defending the interest of the uh, popular classes, has abandoned the popular classes. 
you know, it's all in, in the uh, really in a defined in the terms of the middle class, and then of course you've got all those people who feel completely uh, uh, left aside and seen by the way uh, from you know the, the other one up uh, the deplorable, you know. And, and I think this is really what 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 the problem. So do you think and, uh, now that we have a much further to the left Labour Party and the further to the right Conservative Party, that this is actually better for democracy? I think that's better for democracy. Yes, absolutely. The question is that, let's say, it, it, it again, after I, in my work, I have uh, 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 classified the, the time of the you know, uh, new labor as a post political era, in which basically uh, uh, there was no possibility for citizens to exercise their democratic right because, you know, when they were going to vote, there was finally no difference between center right and center left. And this is left, and we are going to speak about that in, in another question, to some kind of uh, um, blurring, this blurring of the line, people feel disempowered, they lose interest in voting. Why should we go to vote if in the end this is not going to make any difference, you know? And I think that uh, the fact that today we are in a situation which some is what I would call a return of the political, there is a, a moment in, in, in which you know some kind of agonistic debate could be possible. Of course, is the question, and I think that's of course about uh, this. Let's say the, the us them. You know, this is important. Remember, for instance, when they were saying we are all middle class. No, you know, so we should be able to agree. And I think that is fatal for uh, uh, democracy in, in Britain. You know, I think it's very important that people feel. You know, politics is, is something that uh, um, mobilizes passion. And how can you mobilize passion for a situation in which you don't have the possibility of choosing? So I think that it, it is important that there is. A, of the political. But this return of the political, of course, can lead to more authoritarian uh, form of, of uh, democracy. You know, if the, the uh, Boris Johnson, you know, uh, with this project is able to win, I mean, this is not going to be good, but in my view, at least, for uh, British democracy. Uh, so it, it is uh, this what I call uh, we are living in a populist moment, populist moment which really is a resistance against this kind of you know, center uh, politics, and it opens the way to two different solutions. So I think we are in a very uh, uh, interesting moment, but dangerous also because it depends who is going to be able to you know really find a way to articulate in a progressive way. The, the demand of the popular sector, which has been completely abandoned and left aside by you know, the, the, the people at the centre. Okay, let, let, yeah. let me, uh, as a person of the centre, right, against, against these two positions, let me try to defend it. I, I think that it is true. There are a lot of angry people. There are a lot of angry people who vote for Corbyn. There are a lot of angry people who vote for Boris. There are people who may not manifest it through anger. They may manifest it simply through their vote. And it's clear that uh, an enormous number of people, the overwhelming majority, I suspect, of this country feels disenchanted, disenfranchised, fed up with the politicians, fed up with the system. But my point is that their position, in the end, is fundamentally destructive. It's a revolutionary destructive position. It is not a constructive policy for government. Now, it can be dressed up as such. So if you are a theorist, of Boris Johnson, or you are a theorist of John McDonald, you can provide an account where you say, no, 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 it's not true that we are destructive. We have a very positive political program. This is our view on housing. This is our view on FE colleges. This I but what you're drawing on, the tap root of this thing, uh, is often something quite, quite different. Uh, if you actually notice what happened in the, in the parliamentary debates, Everybody, when we were debating the leadership, was trying to say, we must get beyond Brexit. We must talk about housing. We must talk about education. In the end, it was all nonsense. That entire leadership fight was about one thing and one thing only, which was really about Brexit. And in fact, probably the craziest thing in the BBC debate I found was 10 minutes into it, Emily made this interrupting me and saying, OK, enough about Brexit. Let's now talk about our different views on education, employment, black where we all issue very similar sounding platitudes about all these kinds of things and nobody gets anywhere, right? So, 
I think we have to begin with what we actually believe in, right? What we actually think is right for the country. I absolutely agree. There seemed to be a strategy in 1997 of sounding like a centrist, because that's where the votes feel. There is a strategy today that appeals to many of my friends who were centrists in 97, and who now are lining up behind Boris, of believing the votes are on the extremes and they need to play to them. But my question is, what is it you actually think is right for this country? What is your view? on how you're going to keep the services going. What is your view on immigration? What is your view of the role of the state? And on those things, I do not think, certainly within my own party, people are being as clear or honest as they can be. They signal, they whistle, they suggest implicitly that they have various kinds of views which are totally at odds with their expressed views two years ago on all these kinds of subjects. And the one thing missing in this type of politics is always the word how. They're always telling you what they want to do. They are never really telling you how they're going to get there or what sacrifices or what problems are going to occur along the road to that destination. Precisely because we don't have the concept to talk about the, the new socio-cultural politics. So they want to they want to implement Brexit. You know, I mean, is that right wing to want to implement something that people have voted for and then voted for again in an election in 2017? Well, of course, it's not. Tell in the Home Office, for instance, and she's indisputably more right wing in her attitude to crime and punishment. Yeah, but Tories overall are miles less right wing than they were 15 or 20 years ago. They believe in equality. Yeah, just look at look at what they say. Yeah, this is what everybody believes, I know, but it's actually not true. I mean, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, most Tories, uh, well, austerity was supported by the Labour Party, it was, and it's been, uh, versions of it have happened in other countries too, you know, we did have a massive deficit that had to come down, um, and you know, they're now taking an opportunity, Tories are now taking an opportunity to pump money massively into the, into the public sector. Um, that, you know, this old centre ground that that Rory wants to go back to doesn't exist any longer. We've got to produce a new centre ground. Well, you're telling us it did exist, and there was a huge consensus yeah. between the parties. Well, there is on certain, there is on, on left right issues. There is a big consensus, um, not between the parties because the, the uh, Corbyn has taken over the Labour Party. But, but, but in the in the general public, there's a big consensus on socio-economic issues now, and actually, the, and I think the Tories uh, partly reflect that. Where where it all went wrong was actually back in 2010. It was when. George Osborne and David Cameron thought that it was fine just to, to, to repeat new Labour policies, particularly in socio-cultural areas. And, you know, Osborne used to, to boast about this. You know, he sort of said, you know, Tony Blair was the master. He, he, he had established a new centre, but that new centre was crumbling at the very time when they were taking over. Um, because it hadn't taken into account the, the, the feelings of large parts of the population on lots of things that are quite, you know, intangible and difficult things to do with okay, community. Okay, let me my question but, on this, because, mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, we, you know, if we're talking about these socio-cultural liberal values, suppose that politics starts to split between, you know, social conservatives yeah. and social liberals. Does the socially conservative government come in and ban gay marriage? And what happens? No, what happens that, to the gay couples no. who are married? And does it come in and say? But, 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 but that's a very good point. Idea. That's a very good point. Okay. So, and it's, this speaks to what you were talking about, Rory. So, George Osborne and David Cameron do do gay marriage. Okay. This is a conservative party doing gay marriage. <laughs> yeah. um, that is, you know, they, they do gay marriage, but why didn't they also, so that, that satisfies, you know, the liberal end of British opinion, so why didn't they at the same time balance the vote and do something for, for the more traditionally minded, there are a hell of a lot of more traditionally minded small c conservative people well, out there as well, and they used to vote, they used to vote conservative, and they stopped voting conservative, the whole point of having a two party, one pass of the first pass of post system, is that the two parties congregate everybody into their, from left and right into their, into their boat. And the Tories took their eye off the ball, they allowed UKIP to grow up to their right, and we ended up with Brexit. And I, I, I blame George Osborne for that. Chantal. <laughs> we should not mix the question of left and right with the question of Brexit, because uh, they are different things. It's true that today, 
could say most people, if you uh, would you say, or they divide, is is more than uh, the Brexit issue. But I don't think that this is a good thing for democracy. You know, and this you can't imagine that uh, one should say, okay, no, the, the for the, the, the coming years, the frontier is going to be between uh, uh, the pro Brexit and the, the anti Brexit, the remain. But by the, and by the way, in fact, uh, this is a. Uh, so it, uh, it cut across left and right. There are people on the left, I mean, the Lexit, for instance, who, who are in favor of, of, of uh, uh, leave, you know? So we can't just say that, that, that it's clear. So it, it cut across that. But, and today, obviously, so the question that uh, uh, has no passion among people is the question of the Brexit. But you're not going to stay there forever, hopefully. Uh, and, and so I think what, what is important here, and I would like to come back to, to the uh, point I was making before, when we have this, you know, opposition is frontier uh, between precisely uh, different strong opinions, what is very important is to impede that this struggle, this opposition, will take the form of a friend and enemy uh, uh, opposition. That is something that would be very bad for democracy. And uh, I think it's very important that, and I, it's a question of even the institution, the procedure, the, the, the two camp, uh, treat themselves as a protocol adversaries. Or adversaries recognizing the legitimacy of the demand of the others and uh, trying to find, uh, I'm, I'm going to set up not even a question of compromise, because it's not, the, okay, we are all going to, uh, you know, agree on, on, on some kind of wishy-washy center, uh, but uh, try to say we are going to accept some procedure. We are going to fight and you know uh, accept the, 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 the right of our, our op opponent to defend the AC because I think that th this is what is central for democracy, not establish an, an agreement, a consensus, and the is to trans, what I call that, to transform antagonism into an agonist, impede that the two uh, uh, position, uh, opposed groups will really uh, negate the right of the other. And I think that there, there is a certain danger today, uh, and, and obviously it's much easier this thing to happen when you have, for instance, a divide between Brexit and, 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 and non-Brexit. Because there is really no possibility there of uh, recognizing, or uh, let's say, no possibility, uh, it's not really true, but it's much more difficult you know, to, to find a way in which you can accommodate the project. Personally, I mean, I know that uh, uh, people not interested, but I think that given the situation today, the only solution would be a soft Brexit. Because I think that it's the worst would be that one of the camps would say, we've won, you know, and, and, and unfortunately the, uh, the people are really very divided on this, this issue. Okay. So, uh, okay. so, so Brexit will be, no, nobody nobody's going to be happy. Yeah? Brexit is, ah, that's not really Brexit. The other ones are, we not. But at least nobody is going to be able to say, we've won. And I think this, this is what is let, let, let me take on to that, because so I think this is a very important. I am passionately in favor of a Brexit deal, a compromise. I think it's really, really dangerous that people are trying to see this country in this U-shape and everybody's being put into a Remain camp or a no-deal Brexit camp. Right? The reason why I voted against a no-deal Brexit is not just that I think it would be unbelievably damaging and unnecessary thing to do to our economy, but I believe you'll be storing up years and years of rage from Remain voters if you delivered a no-deal Brexit. And it would become one of the great founding myths for the next 30, 40 years, a Tory no-deal Brexit would be perceived in the way that Mrs. Thatcher is perceived in a great deal of the North East today. It would be one of those issues, right? Ditto, I think that were you to go down the Lib Dem route of not holding a second referendum and just going for full revoke and remain, then all those people who voted for Brexit thinking the elite hates us, the elite will ignore us, they think they're too good for us, confronted with people saying, you're not even going to have a second chance of it. You were just wrong. We're going to ignore the referendum. We're going to remain. That also will set up decades of division, right? But the problem is it is very, very, very difficult to generate the language around this kind of compromise because people don't feel the votes are there. I mean, my entire party leadership campaign was predicated 
while trying to get a compromise. And of course, I failed. I failed dramatically because people pointed out nobody really is interested in supporting this kind of position. And the pollsters who do this open close, or sometimes somewhere anywhere, or sometimes diversity wealth divisions, keep saying you're going to be killed if you try to locate yourself in the loop. You have to decisively choose. Are you going to do what Dominic Cummings, I believe, is trying to do, which is decisively wrench the Conservative Party ground to create a base in Hartlepool, Sunderland, Bishop Auckland, trying to pick up effectively white work, signaling, by signaling not just that they share their Brexit positions, but by signaling that they share all the other positions that David is gesturing towards. And I think the final thing I want to say is, look, of course these things are difficult. When I voted for gay marriage, I made a lot of people in my constituency very, very angry. That's true. Right? It's true that many, many people in the country and the vast majority of people in the Conservative Party did not want gay marriage. Right? But there is a question about how I, as a politician, respond to that fact. Particularly when, if we now go five years forward, People are now completely ambivalent about the issue of gay marriage. I mean, it turned out that many, many of those people... But if you look at the polls, uh, currently it doesn't really feature in people's views at all. It's neutral, right? So people who were ferociously angry with me for voting in favor of gay marriage are now perfectly relaxed about it five years later. And I'm not sure what the implication is of what David is saying. Yes, it's true, of course. I have many people in my constituency who have deep views anti-immigration views, anti-European Union views, pro-no-deal views, uh, and did have an anti-gay marriage view. But the idea that I need to just accept this as inevitable, uh, speak to them, produce policies that... Something for them. Why not? Isn't that the kind of balance that we need? The compromise what, what we need? Okay, what, something what, on the family. Make it easier for one parent, either either the mother or the father, to stay at home when children are young. Why not? We, unlike most continental European countries, we do not allow couples bringing up children together to, to, to marry their tax allowance, okay. to merge their tax allowance. So, so the, the answer is, I'm in favour of that policy. Well, we should have done but, that, but that would not be experienced by those people as being a policy of the level of their views on gay marriage or immigration. This would be seen well, as, a, as, 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 that, as a that, That's a political skill. As, you sell it as that as a huge technocratic fix. It's not going to deal with the problem of those attitudes, those values, and that, that outlook. But there was just no appetite to do it anyway. Okay, right, we're going to move to questions, because I can tell there are so many people here who are going to want to ask questions. I'm going to take three, I'm going to take, take them in threes, and could you please put your hand up, wait for the mic to come, and then uh, we'll and then do your question. One over there, these two in the front, and then I promise to go to the back. <laughs> I was wondering if there's also something missing from the centre right, and it's actually surprising that it's missing. So when you had um, Blair, probably you had Clinton, and then Cameron uniting the successful against the rest, you then have the idea, well, we can moderate the pain of that. Yes, it's a meritocracy, the successful will rise. Moderate the pain of that by a little bit of help. But the thing that the centre-right were not good at, and I'm surprised, because it should be one of Rory's core values, they weren't very good at dignity. And there was a sense in which they did not think about the dignity of those people who were left out of that equation. So it's not just about helping, it's not just about making sure people have enough to have services and so on, and, and I'm surprised that that's missing a little bit. Thank you. Yes, uh, Jasmine here on the front. Put your hand up, please. Yeah. Thank you. The thing that depresses me a bit about this debate is it all feels like it's just about politics and what people say about things. And Rory's the only one that mentioned or implied competence and to actually address the how of things. And I wonder whether a centre might emerge of people who are just able to get things done in a very practical way that can be respected. I think of Peru, which is a basket case in many cases um, uh, as an economy, but through five administrations they have stuck to the same macroeconomic policy and achieved 20 years of uninterrupted growth. 
there are some things that just should unite people as being just well done and as probably as good as anybody could make it. So what about competence in politicians? Okay, and if you could pass the mic to the man in front. Yes, you have your hand up for all of you. I think I just heard Rory advocate Jeremy Corbyn's position on Brexit. Good man. You know, have a, have a, a, a negotiate a new deal and then give everyone a vote on the deal versus I, 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 I wasn't. No, I, 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 favored Jeremy, I, I was very strongly in favour of Jeremy Corbyn's position when it seemed like he was a quarter of an inch apart from Theresa May's position. He believed in a negotiated self Brexit deal. That's where I was in favour of him. When he starts, I, I should say I like the centrist yeah, position. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't mean to criticise that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, was that your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we want to talk about dignity and competence. Chantal. Yeah. Well, uh, in fact, I, I want to answer the question of competence particularly because uh, what is it that I to see uh, Rory, for instance, clearly belongs to the view that I have uh, called uh, you know, the associative view. You know, the centre we should all be able to agree and why we not construct uh, politics below, below uh, us, us and them. And of course, this leads precisely to the idea that, uh, well, uh, there are <coughs> political issues, we are not are basically uh, technical issues. If, if there is really no uh, agonistic debate, uh, no, no real choice, uh, but then of course, obviously, you know, the more competent the expert should be the one who decides. But, but that is a very dangerous position, because I think this is the origin of the disaffection of many people, because uh, we are going to listen to you, we are, okay, so, so uh, you can't answer that, uh, the health is issue, if you say, no, 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 that the people, the competent, who, who, who should the expert, I, I think this is precisely the problem with the dominant conception of democracy today. Well, also, you've got to decide what you're going to do before you do it competently or incompetently. Well, yeah, no, but that means, you know, political issue can't be reduced to technical issue. That's what I'm saying. There is something in which people need to have a choice. They are, well, I, I come to my, my view, you know, politics is a both uh, conflicting uh, uh, conception of the common good. Uh, and, and, and then the, there is no center. The center is not a position. The center is the negation of this dimension of the political. Okay, let, let me, let me um, <laughs> let, Let's try to situate this within a real debate. Then let's take Brexit. You can take this view, which, and the implication of it is that no deal Brexit is just the expression of the popular will. Right? It's a political values choice. And that my attempt to argue, technocratically, that it is crazy, right, is irrelevant. Politics is not about technocracy, it's about a, a choice of values. I disagree. Right? Values removed from technocratic calculation are not values at all. For something to actually be good, virtuous, interesting, or of any power at all, it needs to be rooted in reality. It needs to be possible for me as a politician to get beyond saying, the, we have two incommensurable points of view. We don't really debate. You want to know your Brexit, it's just a point of view. No, you are wrong. You have not read the withdrawal agreement. You do not understand the tariff barriers. You have not thought through the kind of negotiation you're going to have to do with the United States. And I want to have that debate with you. And democracy is about having that debate because democracy in the end, the only point of the debate is if it is possible for me to convince you. If the whole thing is simply an expression of my cultural values, forget it. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Well, 
we're, we're going to grow at 2.2% in 2021, even with a no-deal Brexit, according to these guys, anyway. So the truth is we don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, okay, right. But I do think there is a question, I mean, I absolutely agree, both with the technocracy question and with your question, that of course politics is, has got to be more about why as well as how. I mean, the reason, it's been, the reason why we've had this, these eruptions in our politics is because it's been too much about the technocratic power. That, that was what the sort of, the, the kind of Blairite centrist technocratic politics was about. And then we've had a revolt against that. And we've got to acknowledge that to some extent. And the gentleman over there, I think, is absolutely right. That it's curious that modern, modern liberalism and indeed the left finds it really difficult to talk about some of these issues to do with identity and security and belonging. But we've got to talk about them, and we've got to, to, to find new political concepts to deal with them. And, you know, th because a lot of these issues are to do with meaning and psychology and esteem and, and, and honor and things like that that you, that you were talking about, and that's absolutely right. And, and a, a large part of what, what Thomas Piketty rather normally calls the Brahmin left, the Brahmin left and the merchant right, as he describes it, simply sort of don't get these things. And, they're having to get them now. You know, that's why they're talking about investing in FE colleges and socialising adult social care. By the way, I work for a think tank. We just produced a report on... on it's a centre-right think tank. We were advocating socialising adult social care. And guess what? It had a preface by that bowler-hatted monster, Jacob Rees-Mogg, in favour of socialising adult social care, for those of you who think that all, all Tories are extreme rightists. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. That, that, that we've not had the politics of why, and Tories, and, and centre-right and centre-left have both failed in this respect to give us a politics of why, and people have revolted against it. Okay, three more questions. Uh, right, I'm going to take uh, the man at the back there, and the man here, and the woman right here. Sorry? No, I was just thinking this woman here. Um, but I'm afraid the man put their hands up first, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually true. It, it, it is actually true. So wait. Can we just imagine for a minute that Brexit does actually finally get done? Um, what's going to happen next? Is populist nationalism in the UK just going to go away? Are oh, Rory and um, Forrest and the Mog all going to go out for a drink? Is um, you know, peace, love, and happiness going to break out? Right. And, and then here's the man here. Yeah. Right. Put your hand up, please. Marianne, you, you alluded to what I thought this debate was about, which was whether there was a question of the end of the is this the end of the left and the right? Which begs the question, is there a third way? Is there something we've been overlooking? Um, the one thing I keep hearing is Brexit, 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 which is fundamentally, do we think locally or do we think as a smaller planet? Now, my children were yesterday demonstrating. They see this planet as being a very small and increasingly small place. They are internationalists through and through. And they are tired of hearing about what this country needs. Again and again they're told one English child is worth 20 in Africa. They don't agree with that. Now you can call me wishy-washy liberal. I actually believe that is a growth area. Now what are you offering uh, that's different? Okay, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask for the next question just because we're very short of time. <laughs> I'm still working this one through, so it might not be the most clear um, comment and question, but we're talking about, um, how, is it a lot of left and right? And in many ways, I just see the rise of the right. And, you know, we've, we've criticised centuries and, and Blair for, uh, being, uh, of, uh, for being a basis of where we are now. Actually, I look back longingly to Sure Start and lots of initiatives. And I just think... <laughs> Are we making our judgments on what people say or what people do and the consequences of what they do? And the consequences of what has been done by the rights through austerity have been dire for all members of the population. <laughs> for me, that is the basis of a loss, uh, a rise of populism and the loss of people who would ordinarily have been on the left. Right, thank you. And there was another woman, apparently you had her hands up in front. Yeah. 
while combining it with the energy and the anger and the desire for change, which is driving these populist movements. Do we have to allow Boris or Jeremy Corbyn to go away with fairy tales, whipping up a very, very reasonable view that we all share in this room, that things are not good, that there's a lack of dignity, that there's a terribly, terribly shameful things in our society, but not to allow people to take that insight and turn it into a program for something that will ultimately damage us, divide us, and pit us against each other. In other words, in relation to this question about Jacob and Morris, are we going to allow them to release a drunken gorilla and by putting a monocle and a top hat on it, make it suddenly seem acceptable? Thank you very much.
So, what, 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 what do we do with that? Well, if you look up Paradox in Wikipedia, it'll tell you this is a bit of a logical, technical, logical problem, and it's, it's uh, possibly being solved by Russell's theory of types and Tarski's hierarchy of languages. I don't buy either of those things. I don't think it's a little logical problem. It's found at the heart, I would argue, of all of the major philosophical systems of at least the 20th century and for uh, a good deal prior to that. And it comes in lots of different forms. So uh, Russell has it with his uh, mathematics. Wittgenstein had it uh, in the Tractatus. He was trying to say, we're trapped in language. Well, if we're trapped in language, you can't obviously say in language that you are trapped in language. Um, uh, there are many different forms of this. It also applies to, I would argue, materialism. So the idea that there is only material, uh, which there are many people who want to hold this position, the problem with the position that, that it thinks are material is it means that the theory is material as well, and um, a, a bit of material cannot be true or false. It just exists or it doesn't exist. So in the context of materialism, the theory can't be true or false, it just is. So there are lots of other versions of it, uh, Derrida, post-structuralism, they all have this self-referential problem right at the heart of the puzzle. So what's going on? Why do we find this uh, uh, at the center of our theories? Now, many people just dodge this. It's just too difficult somehow. They can't work out what a solution is, so they, they, they uh, ignore it. Uh, I, as a uh, postgraduate student at Oxford, became rather obsessed with the uh, problem, and I've had a go at trying to build an account which deals with that problem. And the sort of answer that I would give is something along these lines. That we imagine, or we, Western thought is in general imagine, that we are describing a world of things out there um, and it's more or less accurate. But I think that idea that we are describing a set of things is uh, uh, a mistake. And that what uh, is uh, a better way of understanding that would be to think that the world is other. It's not like language at all. Language divides things into things and it divides them into characteristics. But that's no reason to think that the world is divided into things and characteristics. And what I think language is doing, thought is doing, is it's a way of holding the world. It's like a metaphor for the world. And we hold the world in these ways, and they enable us to intervene. And they enable us to intervene in ways we can correct and make it better. But they don't enable us ever to describe the other that's out there. There's always an infinite gap between our ideas and the world. And it is in thinking that we might be able to close that gap and actually say how it is that we get into these uh, paradoxes. Uh, now, of course, there's one last thing I want to say, which is this account that I've given you, this story of closure. Uh, you might say, well, aren't you claiming that that's true? Well, I would say the whole point of the theory that I've put forward is to try and account for why it is that we are able to make sense of the world and intervene, it, in, intervene in it, even though our thoughts and language don't describe it. So the account that I've given is an attempt to describe why it's possible to describe the world, uh, why it's possible to say things and intervene in the world without it having to be true. Very Thank you very much. Are paradoxes evidence that our theories are wrong, and is it essential that they are overcome? Okay, um, I'm sympathetic to quite a lot of what Hillary said there, but I'm going to disagree on some things. But what I'm going to do philosophically here is actually give you two views, two opposing views. And one side says that, okay, our theory, if you think your theories are about the world, if you think your theories are actually true if you're a realist, so if you see a theory of physics and you, it says there are a certain kind of subatomic particle and they exist and that's all that exists for physics to work, you think, oh, those things are really there, then it's going to be a serious problem if um, paradoxes arise in your theory because that is actually telling you that fit paradoxes arise in the world. That somehow, if your theory is correct, if your theory is the right one, 
that implies that actually the world is somehow contradictory. Now, that is a very difficult thing to understand. There are a couple of philosophers who accept that, who would actually quite persuasively argue that we can accept the existence of, con that some contradictions are true, or that some paradoxes could actually be manifested. Now, I'm not going to be one of those philosophers, but I'm just kind of throwing it out there, because we're being very sort of, oh, we can't have these things. The natural reaction is you say, well, we can't have such a thing that, you know, the set of all sets. If you think about the set of everything, the set of everything has to contain itself. But if the set of everything contains itself, there's another set of everything. So that has to be contained in the set of everything. And then if you get that set, you've got an even bigger set, and the set of everything now contains the set of everything, which comes, etc. So you start off, so it's going to, it doesn't have a fixed set. There isn't a fixed cardinality of the set, as we'd say. So there isn't a fixed number of things in that set, because it just gets, explodes, basically. So, on the one hand, if you're a realist about theories, if you think that our theories are actually about the world, the, the appearance of paradoxes are, is really problematic. On the other hand, if you take the view, it's perhaps similar to what um, Hillary's described, but also other views, you could say, well, okay, our theories are trying to model the world, they're trying to explain the world. They may not actually pick out what's actually in it. They may say things that we can, they may predict and explain what's going to happen, but they won't actually tell us what the world contains. So if you're told in a theory of physics that there are quarks, that doesn't mean there actually are little things called quarks. It's just helpful to talk about the world as if there are. Somehow the world behaves as if they're quarks. Theory. Because you can say to yourself, OK, something we're thinking about the world isn't the right way of thinking about it. We've started out with definitions. We start out at common sense level, looking at the world around us, looking at tables and, you know, kind of, the sun and things like this, and trying to work out what it, the whole universe is made of and what the world, what, how things work and so on. That's a very, very big process and that's a very difficult thing to do. And we brought with it our sort of common sense human concepts and common sense human ways of looking at the world. And that's not likely to be the way that we actually ultimately end up explaining it. And physics and other sciences have come a long way with sort of generating different ways of looking at the world and different ways of conceiving of things that are counterintuitive, that don't really fit with common sense, but they do fit with empirical experimentation. So when experiments have been done, that sort of, you know, we can say, okay, well, we think that there must be certain things happening in quantum theory, because when you do the experiment, this is how it works, and we can predict what's going to happen. And that, that is something that, when you get a paradox appearing, you can actually look at things and say, okay, we're making... We're making a definitional mistake, we're making a conceptual mistake. So, for instance, with the set of everything, or, or alternatively, this Russell's Barber's paradox, which is the, you're on, some might know this anyway, but you're on an island, or there's an island, and on the island there's one barber, and the barber shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself. Now, 